was born out of the Disco European initiative that many of you will be familiar with. Um, and that initiative, we go on to the next slide. Next slide. We go. So Disco UK was born out of its sort of sister organization, really, um, Disco Europe. That is an organization that um, aims to digitally unify the breadth of the sort of 150, 170 museums across uh, Europe, which have large natural science collections, and really tries to think very hard about what it would mean to create one virtual museum for those. Um, now, one thing that Disco Europe isn't doing is funding the actual digitization of, of those collections. And that's something, next slide, please, um, that we've been doing rather a lot of at Natural History Museum London. So we've been building workflows to digitize our collections for a very long time now. We're about 5.6 million specimens in. We typically digitize about 400,000 specimens a year. That's a lot of work, as you could imagine. Um, we obviously invest quite a bit in the infrastructure needed to support um, that data and the various pipelines for that data, including some quite innovative techniques, some of which actually I'll be talking about in another session tomorrow um, to extract that information and get that into our systems. Um, and also, we spend a lot of time tracking the impact of all that data. And those impact stories are absolutely critical to our business case as to why we need to do this and also why we need to do this at a national level. Next slide, please. So what is Disco UK? Well, it's a partnership of 90 institutions across the UK um, uh, aiming to really deliver a step change in how we digitize our collections, which is happening in a very fragmented way across the UK at the moment. And the aim is to provide unprecedented access to those collections um, and really unlock the scientific, the economical, the societal benefits of those collections by providing digital access to them. Next slide, please. Um, so this work really kicked off in earnest with a couple of surveys that we did back in 2021. We've been talking to the UK collections community for a very long time, but we got some seed money from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to help us um, really firstly understand what's in UK collections, because there was not even a list, can you believe it? And then also look at the digital readiness and to some degree the digital maturity of those institutions who are asking to take part, because that digital readiness is on a very broad spectrum. Next slide, please. So that data is gathered together in um, quite a nice interactive dashboard, which if you follow that bit.ly link, you can see. And actually, that's a dynamic list. So we're constantly updating those records all the time. In fact, it's 138 million and something odd now um, from some uh, recent respondents to that survey, which is a rolling survey. 23% um, of those specimens have some form of digital record in collection management systems in those institutions. But the vast majority, nearly 8%, 80%, are not sharing their data in any systematic way. And that's something that obviously we can fix. Next slide, please. Um, so as part of this, we're trying to leverage as much existing infrastructure that's already out there. And we're using a lot of GBIF infrastructure to support us. Um, so one of those really key pivotal bits of inf infrastructure is the Global Registry of Scientific Collections, um, which is a fantastic list of collections, but it's not really curated in perhaps quite the way that we might like. So one of the things we did is take all of our survey data and then help those institutions to curate their records within GR Cycle. And as a result of that, most of the UK institutions not only have a record now, but they've also updated their record. So it's just some high level metadata just to log the fact that those collections exist. Next slide, please. Um, we also built a, a data portal. And this, in fact, uses a relatively new bit of GBIF infrastructure. This is the GBIF hosted portal solution, which brings together all of the data that UK institutions are publishing presently through the GBIF network. And the great thing about those hosted portals is that you can slice and dice your data in aggregations in ways that are relevant to you or a particular community. And in this case, we're bringing together the uh, UK collections. And in the, in the space of about three weeks, 
literally that fast for a data portal. I've built them before. They normally take years. But in about three weeks, um, we were able to get together um, about 11 million records and actually have a very nice site that works very well, not only in terms of aggregating usage stats for the UK, but also bringing together those um, UK records. Next slide, please. And then the last bit of um, GBIF kit that I'll mention, another kind of pivotal tool, um, something many of you will be familiar with, is the integrated publishing toolkit, which is GBIF's kind of relatively low barrier to entry toolkit for publishing data to the GBIF network. It is beyond the, the ability of many of the UK institutions to host their own instances of the IPT, but we can host one for them. And then now we're working with various organizations who want to get their data into this network through the IPT um, to publish their data. Next slide, please. Um, so we also published a rather nice kind of glossy blueprint, which is sort of the plan. It's part plan, part promotion, really to try and um, begin to build those narratives about why a national digitization infrastructure was needed and who it would benefit. Um, and uh, you can go and download that from the uh, Disco UK website, or if you follow that link there, um, it's on Zenodo too. Next slide, please. Um, and another piece of work that we done, we did is we've spent a lot of time trying to track the benefits of natural science collections. And a very important element of that is these, those economic benefits. So this is actually some work that's about a couple of years old now, but working with a consultancy group called Frontier Economics, we used a theory of change methodology in various different business sectors where we know they're using our collections and basically trying to track the sort of what if stories, had we digitized those and kind of scaling up their existing use, what would be the economic benefit? And the bottom line is about, 30, uh, about two billion um, pounds of economic impact just in those sectors alone, in really what is actually quite a narrow survey. And that ultimately represents a return on investment compared to cost of digitization of probably something in the region of seven to 10. In fact, it's actually probably a bit bigger than that now. But that's a very important part of that story, that business case about why, um, uh, how, why you need to digitize and what are the economic benefits critical for funders. Next slide, please. Um, we've also just finished a piece of work actually with McKinsey. <clears throat> Again, if you follow that link, you'll get to a, a recent paper that was published in Rio, looking more at the sort of demand and benefits of UK collections from a user perspective. Um, some really nice little stats uh, came from that piece of work, one that I particularly like. So if you look at UK collections as a whole, they're cited in about 12% of all publications using GBIF mediated data, and yet UK collections constitute out of the total of those records, just 0.3% of all those records. So in other words, those collections are punching above their weight by about 40 times, which is actually really important message again to get to get across to funders um, and we can also do things like start to track savings from physically having to visit museums and also um, we spend a lot of time tracking again using GBIF tools um, uh, the publications that cite uh, UK collections data too which is really critical next slide please um, how are we proposing to organize all this so we have a sort of hub and spoke structure where there are 12 major collections across the UK being coordinated by um, uh, the NHM, and then lots and lots of small local collections, often with really important collections, but working regionally and sort of opting in, because it's a big ask for some of those small institutions to um, jump up uh, uh, and do this. And so they'll be working closely with those regional collections and Natural History Museum London as the coordinating body. Next slide, please. So uh, just in August, which feels to me like a very long time away, but I appreciate it wasn't, we submitted a national infrastructure digitization bid to something called the um, Infrastructure Advisory Committee. And this is the group that, to some degree, charts and plans the UK research infrastructure roadmap, at least the science elements of the roadmap. Um, that proposal is currently in review. It actually is structured not just as one option, we actually have to kind of come up with a range of different options. So there are five options in that high level proposal. 
uh, ranging from about 60 million to about 311 million. Common to each of those options are three different elements. Obviously, the bulk of that money under whichever scenario you go for is in the cost of digitization. That's the bit that really costs, and that's the bit that is really hard to get money for. We've also got a level of infrastructure underpinning all of this work that we're doing, and something we call the catalysis unit, which is, for those of you familiar with kind of US collections, is a bit like the discussion that's going on at the moment about the National Collections Action Center. But that's really about not only accelerating the process of digitization, but also catalyzing the impact and the benefits and the science on top of all of that data. Um, and then obviously those options iterate based on the various collection types that you choose to digitize and the breadth of institutions that you can reach out from our national collections across Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, uh, and in England, um, right the way through to ultimately all of those small local collections. Next slide, please. Um, so we did some very detailed modeling behind all of this, um, partly using some of our survey data, partly using our digitization rates that we know we're getting from the Natural History Museum's program. Uh, and we incorporated what we call stretch rates. So they're quite ambitious. Uh, they're what we would really need to kind of work out to stretch out. But that takes into account technology improvements that we're likely to make over the next few years. And then the costs are all calculated based on those different baselines. And also because of kind of rules governing the de development of UK infrastructures, we have to include a very healthy contingency budget. About 31% of those numbers that I quoted is contingency. Next slide, please. Um, we also have to submit what we call a preferred option, which in our case was about the sort of middling um, option in our range, and that would cover about 70% of the relevant UK collections. It would do funds for all types of collections, and it sort of is that right balance, I think, between achievability, value for money, and ambition. Um, that if we get the nod from uh, that group in uh, uh, December, so we'll have a kind of informal advice in December about whether they are choosing to take that bid forward, then we've then got a process of about 18 to 24 months to write the full business case. Uh, that's a very complicated process, one I am familiar with because we do it in other circles at the Natural History Museum when we're building buildings and things like that. Um, but that is quite a complicated process that would ultimately land with the UK government treasury and that would uh, unlock the funding. Um, and um, I'm frequently asked when I talk about this, do we have a plan B? Do we have a plan C? Yes, we do. They're maybe not quite as inclusive, but we do have other funding um, routes to make this work too. But I think this is the best chance the UK has ever had to really try and unlock that national collection. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Um, just to acknowledge a few of my colleagues on the Disco UK team. So Helen Hardy, my deputy, um, is now the program manager for Disco UK, and also picking out um, Tara Wainwright, who's our kind of coordinator within Disco UK. A lot of work goes into building these um, big infrastructure business cases. It's quite a team effort. So big thanks to them. And thank you very much. Um, great, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for being on time. We have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I have to say that I don't have the microphone. Do we have the microphone in the room? Thank you. Um, and I'll start while the microphone is coming up by asking Catherine a question. And she's going to have the microphone. Um, so Catherine was the only one who talked about a resource which is just starting out. So can you tell us what are your plans for long-term sustainability? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, we have made an application for funding um, as yet we we're still waiting for a response. Um, but one of our major partners is Bioplatforms Australia and the Australian Biocommons. Um, and so far they like what we're doing. And so there is a lot of interest in continuing to partner with the Atlas of Living Australia on that. Um, but I think our main notion or concept about it is that we're, we're stronger when we're, you know, it's a cliche, but we're stronger together. And, and 